All right. So who am I? Who are we with? We're with the Globe and Tears. Did I get that right? Yeah. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Isaiah Desta. I'm an event coordinator here at 4Geeks Academy. We have some of our students here. I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce uh, our speaker today. We have Cam Daly, hailing from Seattle. She is a technical director in the Metaverse and Gaming Studio. Her interests include AR, VR, game development, and her personal interests include music, Taco Bell, Cruncher App Supreme. <laughs> Hey, I'm with you. I'm with, I'm yeah. absolutely with you. I'm right there. They've got the vegetarian yeah. version now. I can't stop. Won't stop. Oh, I haven't had it. Okay, that's up next. I got to write that down. It's good. All right, Cam, feel free. Take it away. All right, cool. Thanks for the intro. Um, like we said, I'm Cam Daly. I'm a technical director here at Globant in our gaming and metaverse studio. Um, we have a bunch of speakers here. Before we get to them, I want to just talk briefly about what Globant is so you know who we are and, and where where we're coming from. Um, so Globent is a professional services company, a consulting company. Um, and what that means is we help other companies build, uh, design, architect, deploy, ship uh, their software projects. Um, so uh, we're in, uh, in um, a consulting company in comparison to a more traditional product company, a product company like a Google or a Facebook or, you know, a... Uh, uh, a game company, they have a product that they're working on. They own it. Facebook owns or Meta owns Facebook. Um, they get to make all the product decisions. They get to have engineers who are building that. They're hyper focused on that. Company like Lovent, we help them achieve that. So if they need to build in a technology that they're not comfortable with or familiar with, if they need to build something really quick, so they need to scale up to a bunch of people um, to get something done on time, um, if they need to take over a piece of software that internally their engineers don't want to work on anymore or don't have the skills to work on anymore that's where globant steps in um, and to help out so the benefits of working at a company like globant uh, is that you get to touch a lot of technologies we have people who are um, who are brought on uh, in specific technical areas um, but we tend to not be locked too much to specific technologies and so we're encouraged to be very um, what is it t-shaped right so t has like it, you cover a lot of skill sets, uh, but you're really good at one thing. And so we tend to um, promote a lot of T-shaped developers, uh, as well as being cross-industry, because we don't, because Globant doesn't work with just a specific subset of customer in a specific industry. We cross a lot of industries um, from manufacturing to retail to uh, media and sports uh, and game development all across the board. So uh, Globant's a great place to get some Globant and companies like Globant is a great place to get uh, that level of experience. Um, so that's Globant in a nutshell. Um, so I will walk through our speakers that we have today and just give them a brief introduction. Um, so Globant tier number one, we have Jonathan who hails from Bogota, Colombia. His title is DevOps, SRE engineer and interests include communities, video game, Linux, family and God uh, for all of those believers out there. Uh, Jonathan, did I miss anything there? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm as part of the cloud engineers here in in, in Glow on site, so I appreciate this part of time, and also I'm very happy to and excited to share with you what kind of uh, pata is right for stay here. So thank you for the time. Great, thanks. If you have questions specifically about DevOps or Reli reliability engineering, be sure to ping Jonathan in the chat. If you have questions, put them in the chat, or if there's a QA section here, I don't think there is. So chat's just fine. Uh, Globe and tier number two, we have Kevin from Seattle, Washington, my current living location. Uh, he's a software designer in the Web UI studio, and his personal interests include home improvement, board games, video games, and raves all at the same time. Uh, Kevin, did I miss anything there? Nope, that about covers it. Um, I will take any web dev questions you may have and try to answer them to the best of my ability. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Globe tier number three, we have Bruno, who hails from all the way from Buenos Aires. So he's not even in the US right now. He's way ahead. You're, what, four hours ahead of us now? Um, your title is Web UI UX. Uh, interests include gaming, music, movies, and cooking. Uh, Bruno, did I miss anything uh, on you? Yeah. Uh, Yes, we are uh, champion world of soccer. I don't know if you know it about that. Uh, I, Messi in the last uh, championship. 
it's very awful to say it. Uh, first, Argentina, second France. I don't mm -hmm. want to uh, offend <laughs> anybody, but we have to say it. Uh, nice to meet you, Jonathan. We see face to face as first time. We also participate in a mentorship for Colombian uh, students and we uh, make uh, some efforts for the new student to start working in process and also to be in what university start work. Uh, I think anything else to say. All right. Well, shots fires, fired in the football arena already <laughs> uh, for those believers of football up there. Uh, and next, or not next, finally, we have uh, our global tier number four, Facundo, who's in San Francisco. So kind of like the enemy of Seattle to some degree. Uh, he's a data scientist. His interests include data and AI, sports, boxing, F1, and not video games, apparently. Did I used I miss to, but I, I, I gave up on that a long it's time ago. It's too late. You're dead to us. Did yeah. I miss anything? <laughs> yeah, it's... It's time consuming. <laughs> no, uh, basically, I, I'm originally from Argentina, but as Cam says, I'm, I'm living in San Francisco and uh, I work as a data scientist. I used to work as a data engineer and I also used to work a full stack developer in the back end. So I kind of I try to do it all. Yeah, you follow the hype, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Facundo. All right. Uh, did I miss any of our speakers? I think that was everyone. That's everybody. Awesome. OK, let's dive into the question. So I see a couple in chat. I will pick those up as we go along. Um, but the first one, and a pretty common when we get asked by students, um, how can I distinguish myself as an applicant with less than one year of programming experience and no college degree or experience in the tech field? Yes. Anyone want to pick that up? Uh, I can take it. All right. So. Um, Distributing yourself as an applicant, there is plenty of open source software out there. Um, and so find like a project that you're particularly passionate about or like some open source uh, thing that would potentially help you in your like day to day life and see if you can start contributing to it. Um, for example, I have um, uh, at, in in my interest as home improvement, um, I have a automation system called Purpose. Um, so that's why I run my home security for my house is uh, improving upon that platform. So uh, find something you're passionate about within like open source. Uh, try picking up some issues with pull requests and and. Um, that will get you noticed by the broader open source community, and it's a good way to practice your skills. Awesome, Kevin. I agree with that. Uh, Kelia, could you mute, please? I think your microphone's going off. Okay. Please and thank you. Um, I would. So when I look for a candidate, um, especially a, a young one, I mean you're kind of against a giant pool, right? You're against a giant pool of, of uh, people who have a degree, you're against people who are um, who have gone through boot camps as well. Uh, and for me, the distinguishing factor, and Kevin, you kind of touched on this, is like, wh what have you built just because you wanted to build it? Not because you were in a class and you were told to build it, but like, what, what have you painfully had to birth from nothing uh, in terms of code, like a project that you've built? And I think that that, that to me, uh, for for um, junior devs who and trainee devs who have done that and felt the pain, but had to write something to completion, you learn from that and being able to show like this isn't the best code, but here are my learnings. Like I learned that having a bunch of globals not a great idea at, at some point, and I learned that having a, a framework using a framework like React is way better than maybe writing it all by hand initially to get stuff done. Uh, but you also get the learnings of when things break, when things fall apart, uh, how to solve problems really is is what what people are looking for with with those projects. Um, so that's what I'm always looking for is that that proactivity, that work that you've kind of applied what you've learned into something that's wasn't there before and no one told you to do explicitly. You just did it, suffered through it, and you can show it off. Even just building your own website. Um... Mm -hmm to host your resume is a good option for yeah. uh, 
um, differentiating yourself from other candidates. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to say something? You have your hand raised. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's pretty awesome, the advice related for the open source community, because that's what you have this uh, on these two directions, because you know how to the communities are, and also you know how to the experts behind of these communities are part of this. That's pretty awesome because I'm a part of the CNCF glossary side and I'm working on it. Um, work uh, help to the this um, com communication skills from uh, English to my modern language that is Spanish. And also, you know, in these groups, a lot of uh, guys that have a lot of experience behind of, and also they teach to you and helps to you growth in the technology side. So if you want to learn something related for, I don't know, Kubernetes, that is my specialty, or or for another that is related for uh, the Golang or the Python side, you explicitly know which of these communities are, and also you can follow these, and you know a lot of amazing people behind of, and also they have the opportunity to teach you on guidance, and they could take uh, a links or could be some path for you can address for your effort and it's pretty awesome because you know exactly how the um, technology is and how to the framework are that it's awesome for for my side and the another part is the the eager that you could be have for for consume this part of the technology one books that i like sincerely that is the the element and you exactly identify how with this you can uh, spread your knowledge and you uh, major for and you generate this passionate behind of the technology and you identify exactly what kind of uh, what kind of thing do you want to follow. That is pretty awesome. I think that is that could be the the ones of the um, things that I follow that try to share with all this energy and also identify with them how do they can exactly identify that the elements that they need to know exactly to try to figure out using the technology side could be that it's pretty awesome for for my side that is my, awesome. my advice um so i just want to add on one one to that uh, question real quick uh, i would say the the other thing that's going to distinguish you is if you can network with people now like that's to get past the sea of of applicants early on having a network that you're developing here with the people um, who you're you're um, uh, in classes with, uh, as well as um, uh, with the the resources that are available to you from for geeks, as well as if you're going to events, if you happen like if like there are local groups, meeting those people, networking with them, um, leveraging those connections uh, is always going to increase the odds that somebody gets to see your resume uh, and maybe this talks to like question two i want to I, but i want to give uh, facundo time to to answer yeah. on one as well, well. just a, a quick uh addendum to that uh, comment is that uh even though uh, all of this is a, it's a great advice and i adhere to that uh in my experience and on, along the years uh they also take a, a great importance in terms of not only the the interviews they take, but also in the new clients, even in the same company, since we are providing services, they uh, always requested me a carefully crafted GitHub repo where you have some visuals or something that is related to your. So that's a very pragmatic thing to do that you should keep building over the years, and it doesn't have to be uh, a huge effort. But rather than you have a GitHub first landing page, and then mm -hmm. you can just Add wherever you want there. So that's a very concise thing that you can do to show yep. that you are doing it. Um, Bruno. Yes, uh, what I was telling is uh, no one is born in knowing everything. So uh, for the applicant, uh, anything that you have to learn, you have to be uh, with the enthusiasm and also with the time to do it. So I think uh, my advice is to be organized with your time. And if you had to learn a new 
languages or a new system or a new application, etc. Take your time to learn it. So when you start working, you can do it well. Mm -hmm. uh, adding of all the guys are telling, I think that's what I can add. Awesome. Thanks, Bruno. Um, so the next one's a little bit in line with this. What's the hiring market like? I don't know if anyone, us, any of us know what the hiring market is like explicitly for full stack developers. Um, but the one piece of advice I consistently give uh, is that new students may sometimes think that you can only get a job, uh, a software job in a tech company, like a Google or an Apple or a Facebook. Um, but the reality is, is that every company is a tech company now to some degree. So uh, if you are looking for um, places to work, like cast your net wider, cast your net in industries that you wouldn't think there'd be technology because there is, um, like hospitals need tech, need uh, software engineers now, and um, public libraries all need software engineers now. So, like there are there are real places um, outside of tech that you can look uh, that arguably probably have fewer applicants as well because they're not big tech companies. Um, let's see, we got a question, a couple questions in chat about technologies. Um, what are the uh, question three is what are the most important technical skills you skills you look for in a new hire? Um, anyone want to take a stab at that while I parse what's going on in chat? Proactivity. Proactivity. I like that one. That's it for and me. <laughs> I think that goes back to like having a GitHub yeah. where you've been working on things. Exactly. That, yeah. Enthusiastic. That's the key to presentation. Yep. Yeah. Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. So I the continue. question. Oh, sorry, sorry, go on. I continue saying about keep uh, keep on learning or, or get the time to learn the new stuff. Yep, technology doesn't stop um, for better or for worse. So you do have to have a the energy to just program something in a language you're not comfortable with just to learn it or reading up or even watching YouTube videos these days. Um, let's see, what are the main programming languages employers are looking for? That's a tough one. Everyone's looking for everything, I think. Um, but Python is a good a good um, uh, suggestion from Kevin, because Python is being used in a lot of things, whether it's data engineering, Fecundo, or AI, um, or just writing services, writing backend services. Um, like Python is kind of used a lot in a lot of different popular places right now. Um, let's see. Uh, there was a question earlier about what game engine. That's what tech. So I use Unity. I have a preference for Unity because it it's a kind of a multi-purpose engine. So whether you're building actual games or you're building 3D simulations for medical companies, which I've done before, or building just 3D powered uh, applications, uh, it's it's useful for that, and it can target every known platform known to man. Um, for for reasons I don't know why, but they do. They support uh, deploying to all all platforms, um, so it can be real a real useful um, technology to have if you're looking to get into the gaming or gaming adjacent space. Uh, anyone want to add to the uh, technical skills you look for? I would say tenacity, um, being able to. Um, even if you don't understand a problem or what's going on, um, at least like try to repeat the question, think your way through it, suggest to the interviewer, like here is like my initial idea, um, like start explaining, see if like you get something wrong. And if you do, that's all right. You can continue trying, mm -hmm. um, but don't freeze because the t your time is valuable in both the interviewer and for you, the interviewee. So you want to make sure that um, you talk through your thinking process and you don't leave gaps for silence uh, because they can't get a read on like how good your skills are if it's just silence during the call. That's good advice. And I'm going to talk quickly so I don't leave a gap uh, of silence between what you've said and what I'm saying now. Uh, in the chat, there's a question about certifications, uh, specifically for full stack developers. I mean, I would look to our web devs here, but I don't think people look for certifications at this point, unless uh, question number four I have here, it's related to cloud um, cloud development. So AWS, GCP, Azure, all of those certifications are still really uh, good to have. Um, but uh, web devs, what are your certifications? 
I don't have uh, to agree with your um, cloud technology certifications. Uh, I have seen a lot of discourse online about people going like, why is my AWS bill so high? What's the last service that I didn't turn off that's charging me money? And uh, so yeah, figure it, figure out how that works so you don't end up in that situation. Sorry, I cut you off, Bruno, go for it. Yes, uh, you can have uh, a thousand of certification of everything, but when you have to work or when you have to show your skills in the code, there is what matters. Uh, yep. You can have only one or thousands of the certification, but when you're working, uh, uh, you can see what you know, what you know. Uh, something I can add about what Kevin told recently is don't be afraid to make a question when you start working uh, about anything, about the project, about the, the process, about the business, etc. because you are learning and some things you can don't know or also you can miss. So not to be afraid to make the question to your uh, PM or to your TL, etc. So uh, don't be afraid about that. Jonathan. Yeah, thanks. Also, related about um, back to the certification side that is uh, part of my side, especially for the cloud side. Uh, I sincerely check at this time all guys that try to get uh, figure out inside of uh, current uh, a couple of POCs or proof of concepts instead of these clouds, and also they are very available using the Azure GCP. Uh, another cloud um, for this, but at the end of the day, it's easily if you know that, because when the companies start these uh, journeys to the cloud, that is exactly the term for doing this, uh, they are try to understand how to they can uh, take advantage for this. A lot of service that currently the cloud they had, uh, have, uh, how do they can use this? Um, services instead of and also if you will uh, move to the development side you can um found a certification focused for the development side and also i know guys that that's part for the development that's part for the qa as part for the security side and also they already start this journey for the cloud and they study for the cloud side. So uh, I sincerely uh, give to you ad advice related for this uh, certification. And also, if you have the opportunity to know how the cloud is and which of these uh, count kind of topics are related for the cloud side, you try to figure out, uh, you definitely uh, follow this. And also, this is a big difference with one guy that don't take this uh, advantage for the cloud. And also if you take this for, for, for the cloud side, you have could be the differentials between around for the uh, public instead of. So I sincerely recommend that uh, mm -hmm. one certification on the cloud side because could be open, open more doors that than other guys. Yeah, the great thing about cloud services providers right now is AWS, Azure, and, and GCP, they mostly have the same conceptual thing. So if you are learning mm -hmm. at least the high level conceptual services that are there, you're you're good across um, across the others. You obviously couldn't, uh, it'd be difficult to just drop in and write. There are things to learn, but at least you can talk about um, what cloud means in terms of the services that it provides. Also, most provide a free tier um, so if you want to get your hands on one, on an EC2 instance or so, some of the other services, there are free tiers that you can you can work with um, to get a better understanding hands-on of what it means to understand um, a cloud provider. Uh, yeah. also, um, I want to add a little you... comment there because uh, <laughs> yeah. not only on that, because I, in my experience, uh, when you you know have that that cross knowledge, but also. I used to think that uh, uh, Azure and GCP will have killer products from AWS. I have my own assumption on that. And at the end of the day, they catch up and they always keep uh, uh, their products up to date. So it's at the end of the day, it's all cross knowledge. And if you know AWS, which is kind of a standard at, at the end of the every product tier, 
uh, it, it will be useful for any other provider. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, that's right. One one advice at the move to another topic that is related for when you up or turn on your uh, things or services instead of the cloud, please shut up, shut down this, because if you don't, could be this comes to your invoice. Just a little advice here. Mm. Awesome. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Uh, before we pivot to AI, the question in chat is, how long did it take to understand and actually become good in your profession? And good is a subjective term because technology is always changing. Um, I, I would say it, it took me three years before I felt I was able to reason abstractly about all of the systems that are kind of in play in technology. And that's post-college. So after college, after writing code for about three years and starting as a junior and like and like and um, picking up new technologies and building an existing monolithic applications, um, like I would say three years, I was like, okay, I'm still dumb, still very dumb, but at least I can start to reason at this like pr at this higher order problem solving level. I could start writing architecture documentation to explain what code I wanted to write before I could. Uh, and that was when I, I felt like I was on a trajectory to good. I don't know, other people smarter than me. Uh, how did you, when did you feel like you were good uh, professionally? Or are you still not good? It's okay if you're not good yet. Exactly. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, I think that I became good enough. But I was yeah. good, good enough. When I understood that this is not a job that I have to do, it's rather more like a mindset that you need to have. In, uh, you are going to have this problem. It's, it's not going to be solved today or next week or even next month. Mm -hmm. But you need to go back there. And that's when you know that you are good enough when you have that little voice at the back of your head telling, oh, remember the solution you made two months ago? Mm -hmm. It can be improved with this. When you can connect those things that are relevant for your position or your, that's the thing that I think makes you good enough. That, that's why I think just writing projects, like small projects in your free time, they force you to like fail and then succeed. And then you, you don't hold on to the code, right? The code dust in the wind, but the learnings from that, the patterns in your brain where you're like, oh, I, I solved a problem similar to that. Maybe I could use that approach. Like, it's that over and over and over again that really makes you good enough. Good enough that people are like, hey, I'm going to hand you this task and walk away, and I assume that you're competent enough to do it. And then they don't, they don't see you cry in, in public. They, don't, they never see you cry in public. You cry in the shower, um, private places. It's OK to cry, actually. Good, a good cry can, can help you have a breakthrough. Uh, problem solving. Um, all right. A walk, honestly. A walk is good too. Yeah, I guess that's the other thing. Is uh, I guess as as an engineer, you learn that brute forcing by just forcing yourself to sit down in front of your computer for hours and hours until you solve something doesn't always work. You have to get up and let your brain spawn a thread to think about that in the background while you uh, go on a walk. And let your let your brain get away from from the problem you're looking at. It sounds silly, but it actually does work. It does. Um, there's a question in chat about internships. We do offer internships at Globent, but because we're a consultancy and because we're dependent on client projects, it's a it's a little bit um, feast or famine for us. So it's always worthwhile um, to reach out, and I can put you in contact. But at Globit, we tend to hire, in the US at least, a little bit higher seniority just because um, we're working very closely with clients and building their software. Um, but there's always that, that, that chance that uh, we have a client who's super interested in onboarding some, some interns or onboarding some junior devs uh, to help out. OK, I would like to pivot into AI because I think it's relevant now um, or irrelevant, I guess, depending on your opinion. But uh, it's around and people are talking about it. And the technology is now here and usable and useful. 
Um, so question for our speakers today. How can I use AI tools in my work to make me a better candidate for jobs? You can use it if you practice questions and then see if you can solve it. And if you don't, and if you can't solve it, the AI will give you a, a close approximation to the answer, if not the answer. Oh, that's I never even thought about that. Having the AI take on the persona of an interviewer, you answer, and then they tell you if you're right or wrong. Interesting. Any other thoughts? Uh, I've also used it for testing purposes, like uh, generate me tests to validate that my code works the way I intend it to. Um, so like a lot of testing is boilerplate for me. So being able to easily generate that and then validate if I'm going in the right direction mm -hmm. Better developer. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, um, the AI, it's pretty good. That's right. But uh, you know that we need to use that with responsibility because if you drop, uh, I don't know, could be your code, then the code will be public for your site. So you need to take this care for, for it. So for my site, Basically, uh, I try to figure out using the AI more for the um, soft skills more than my hard skills because in hard skills uh, I have a couple of troubles with the AI because we work a lot of, of with files that are currently work with typos. So if you move to the typo side, in, in my case, using the general structure. So if you have one space or you can reduce the one space, you have a lot of problems instead of. So that depends exactly for which of these uh, you can use for that. But one advice that you could be take for this using the, the AIA is exactly the, the how do you use this more for comfortable for you. I try to don't use a lot because he, he, if you have the possibility to find more easily in a couple of, uh, I don't know, in a couple of, of forums or something like that, that it's very helpful because the AA takes this from the form side and also generate for, for you this summary that you need to know very quick. But if you, uh, have the capacity to find this information that you need to get and also you want and you be comfortable with the documentation side uh that's i try you can use this uh more for the documentation side more than the how do the community do or how do the another guy use that for i don't know for implement a couple of services instead of so I recommend use the AA, yes, but you need to address using the responsibility side because if you drop your code, then you have could be a couple of problems if you have tried to maintain your license behind of this. Yeah. I, I would I would say that AI, I think for for junior devs is a little bit of a double-edged sword because um, using it uh, to generate code for you, AI at large language models right now are not are not functional enough to generate code that's perfect. And if for one you're asking an LLM to generate you code, then you're not coding it yourself, which is back to the earlier topic, like writing that code and that pain you feel trying to figure out something and those patterns that you're building, that's important. Two, you're gonna assume this code is fine with not enough experience and you're gonna end up putting code up on your GitHub that doesn't do what it's supposed to do that will not, um, and you'll be asked to explain uh, that you will fail under scrutiny. So I would say that um, using AI right now as a, as a crutch for you developing is not gonna be good for uh, getting a, uh, making you a better candidate for a job. However, if you're working with the technology and embedding that inside of an application that you're building. If you're building this website that Kevin's talking about 
and you want to integrate with open API and say, oh, you know, I dealt with open API, that's kind of integrating with AI, you're really just integrating with APIs. But um, or if you want to go off the rails and call up Facundo and say, hey, how do I I don't know, I don't know AI well enough to be able to, to spitball. How do I how do I get a vector database in MongoDB uh, up and running so that way I can do vector searches on on a on something or other? Um, being able to integrate the technology directly into a piece of software that you're writing, that is uh, going to make you a better candidate. It's a lot harder because there's a steeper learning curve there to understand AI if you're also trying to learn how to write web pages. But um, I would say stay away from saying that you use large language models to generate code because that's not going to help you, I don't think. If I saw that, uh, Unless unless it was for something like I'm a game developer, I write code, but I used um, stable diffusion to generate images. Sure, maybe that's cool that you know how to write prompts to do that. Um, but if you integrated that into a Unity system or a Unity uh, application that you wrote, that could be cool and useful um, because you're not the one. You're I don't expect you to generate images or to do art. That would be terrible if developers had to do art. Um, but leveraging the technologies and integrating them into your your software, that, that part is helpful. There is one use case that I'm completely in favor, and I agree with Jonathan. On the documentation side, uh, it can even help you to write the yeah. very hateful doc strings that you never do write the explanation of your functions, and it, it can double check what you are doing. So it will help you to understand the concept, and it, in the same usage, you get to document your code so anybody can pick it up. Yeah, I agree. I'll, I'll take a, a, a class that I've written, and I'll say, turn this into uh, get, get markup. And it'll do that for me, and it'll be great because I don't have to do any of, of that hand, hand editing of things. Um, all right, uh, there's another AI question. Um, with AI becoming increasingly integrated into our daily lives, how does Globant approach ethical considerations in AI development? And this talks a bit about Jonathan and, and making sure that when you're taking your code that you've written for somebody else uh, or somebody else's code and throwing it into, into these AI systems that like there's a, there's a risk there. That's no longer your code. It could potentially become training materials in the future. Um, but what other ethical considerations um, do should de developers should companies take into account um, when doing AI, integrating AI, doing AI development? Uh, in my experience, when you are integrating AI, you are also sharing your information, your data, and you are also exposing. If uh, uh, one way or another, you are exposing a prompt to the public. So you need to be careful of what are the uh, guidelines that you give. How are you surrounding that uh, AI that you are using with safety? It depends on the case. Like if you have, as Cam said, a stable diffusion, uh, you need to make sure that there's no no nudity, no profanity, mm -hmm. all of those things. That is kind of a uh, checklist. But uh, with the you know with the, everything is so fast, you tend to forget about that. So you need to be kind of learning all the steps always implementing them, have that uh, scaffolding of security that you need to use, and always have it present in any suggestion or implementation that you do. So in terms of what should you do, uh, as I said before, do your own checks, do automatic checks, uh, use guardrails in the real LM that <coughs> you are using, going to implement. So everything is at least in the acceptable community standards. And don't share anything over the internet <laughs> with your LLM. I would also add that, you know, even with like increasing AI, another thing that uh, will make you just a better developer in general is problem breakdown. So being able to like recognize what problem you're facing and then break it down into small pieces um so that will help you design functions methods as needed um and then once you have these smaller problems you could be able to put them into prompts um, for ai and then 
you will be able to take those small individual pieces and then put them together for a whole. So that, under, that ensures that you know what small problems you're solving and you can use those building blocks to solve a bigger problem. So Kevin, could you just take us through, if I came to you and I said, Kevin, I want you to write me a web page. Now that you've written so many web pages, what does your brain do to break that down? Uh, let's go three levels. Uh, Okay. You're on the spot right now. Let's do sure. this. Um, so first off is defining the types of requirements that I want for this web page. Is this like a personal web page? Is this going to be something that needs to be highly reliant and scalable? Like, is it going to serve millions of customers today? Or is it just going to be like something simple? So start by asking, who is the audience for this kind of work? Um, and start deriving the requirements from that. So let's just say it's like my own personal website. Um, and so um, I want to showcase the technologies that are um, that I think are marketable. So I would choose React as like a front end framework. Um, and then as like a starting project, I would uh, say implement a little search bar with debounce um, so that when you type in, like, so say I have a project like autocomplete, for example. So I would break that into smaller pieces. So one, like you want to create a simple website with like a search input. And then two, you want to reduce the amount of requests that are going to your server backend. So you would implement a, a debounce function, which will um slow the rate of responses back from your server so you don't have to deal with so many requests at once so um then you would want to say like what am i searching upon um say you want like news articles um so you could use python to build a web crawler in order to um, crawl around cnn's websites and index them based on title um, and then use the cloud technologies like AWS or like Azure to index them in the database. And so it, it's interesting where your mind goes, because if I were to break that down, not being a web developer, I would say, OK, cool. I know I've got a website. Website has a server component and it has a, a set of like React framework component, like a front end side. Uh, and the front end is going to break down into some HTML, some JavaScript, some CSS. And I know at that point, uh, I need to start deciding of what's in the requirements needs to be done in each of those places. And then I get down to systems uh, after that. And then on the server side, I know I need APIs. I know I need to select um, a way to, to host this content if it's not just static, if it's dynamic um, front end content. And you, it's interesting because you go deep. You're like, I'm going to think about the search bar first. And there's not a right answer, I don't think, in terms of how you how you decide how to break down break down any task. It's just our brains are going to break them down based on our experience. They're going to break them down. What we think is most important, what will showcase my expertise, especially in your case, um, you think that there's a lot of uh, value in focusing on specific components uh, and the technology that's going to back those versus the broader landscape, which is where I mostly come from, is like building out high level architecture and then going deeper into those spaces? Uh, I'm using uh, my web, my uh, search engines class as a template. For ah, OK. Well, that's why I, I drew upon that experience to oh, cool. oh like, because uh, the goal for that quarter when I was back in college was build a search engine from scratch. Here you go. And then they broke it down into four different assignments, which was like build a static web page, figure out how to do autocomplete, mm -hmm. build a web crawler, and then like hook it up all together. Oh, cool. So, so like that was a really cool self-contained project um, that helped me understand like front end, back end, cloud technologies, um, how everything works all together, uh, and a lesson for anyone in cloud technologies, do not put your private keys in your repository, because that is a recipe for disaster. Correct. That's good advice. 
And GitHub will now tell you when you do that. I hope so, because I have seen thousands of dollars go yeah. from, an un, from someone just inadvertently putting in their keys and racking up a very high AWS bill. It's very dangerous. You know, um, tooling, this was a good advice. Tooling like GitHub Actions, they can detect your AWS keys on a lot of things that they make the day-to-day improvements to your work, but they are not in any textbook or anything. So I strongly recommend GitHub, GitHub Actions, especially for Python. Yeah, I think that's another tool that maybe, I, I don't know if boot camps are, are teaching it, but talking about um, CI, CD pipelines, uh, like continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. It was something that wasn't taught to me. It was kind of like, you write code, and you hand deploy it to your server. and Obviously, that's fragile in uh, uh, in a lot of ways. If you're the the only person doing that, um, but you know, back in my day, we had a tool called Jenkins, uh, which was great. You could write little deploy scripts, and you could click one button, and it would grab your code from source, build it, and deploy it automatically. And now we have GitLab and GitHub Actions uh, and build pipelines that you can configure to to do that for you as well. So. Um, as a as a general recommendation, I think it's good to to at least be aware that these um, continuous integration and continuous delivery concepts exist, and and most most reasonable rational companies are not hand deploying things these days. There's this layer of of work that you know DevOps people do now, um, but also is good to have under your belt as you're um, building your own software and, and wanting to to get familiar with those concepts. Um, all right, uh, last one on AI, um, I guess. Uh, are, are there specific projects or applications at Globant where AI is proving to be a game changer? So I guess we can walk through each Glober and like, are you currently using AI in your project? Uh, Bruno, are you? Is, it, is there something in your project that's changing the game um, that you're working on? Uh, we are making a design system for a bank. So what, are, what could I say is the UX is better for the users, but uh, I don't know. It's something very changing for 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 everybody, but mm -hmm. yeah, for the user and also for uh, we can sit here for the grandpas and the grandmas because we have an application specifically yeah. for them that we are using accessibility. I don't know if you know the term for the students or the practitioners. Uh, that's something that you can start also learning and start working because uh, we have to know that everybody. Uh, use the technology, mm -hmm. so we have to adapt the technology for everybody, and not only for for ones or for others. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about accessibility at all, but that's like the the. Uh, but but sorry, no no AI in 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 your project right now, though, as far as you and know. No, because we, like we work in a bank, we have yeah. some politicals that we can do it. Yeah, Evan, what about your team? Your what? project, Kevin. Uh, sorry, Kevin. Uh, uh, can you come back to me? I am going. I'm responding to a chat message. Yes, Jonathan, you. I leave Facundo last because I know he is. Maybe not game changing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Currently, I'm working on the observability side instead of the DevOps side. That is one of the pilots that we have currently for the DevOps. And also, we have the AI game changer here because we follow the errors behind of the applications uh, how do we can use these errors for uh guide the teams behind of these errors how do they can solve it so we start using these on our tools and also we try to um to 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 teach our models how to these uh errors are currently are and how do they users could be fixed because they know how to the uh the governance and also they know how to the um, their process works but they don't know exactly how the infrastructure works so we try to address this using the ai for help today today how they can address instead of these uh, aws accounts or these uh, instead of these uh, environments or something like that, that mm -hmm. it's one of the biggest change 
the challenge that we have currently have, but it's the game changer that we try to figure out using the AI side. Great. And then Facundo, are you on a project that's changing the game with AI? Uh, am I? <laughs> Facundo uh, and I are on the same project. That's yeah. why I make this joke. So uh, since Cam is uh, directing the front end part on the 3D sites and what we are doing in the back end, we are implementing uh, kind of uh, serializing the 3D part and try to make some, I'm tempted to say high level reasoning, even though mm -hmm. LLMs don't do that. Don't believe that they don't reason. It's just that they are very good at predicting the next syllable. Uh, but at the end of the day, it feels like it. And uh, when you start to do things like uh, you cannot just write code to uh, predict something or come up with a summary or a, a high level idea, those are the things that they are being transformed. And it's something that kind of anybody can do. But what we see in terms of AI is that what they are doing is actually they are doing things much, much faster which you can fail much faster <laughs> and you can fail enormously if you're not careful. But uh, for instance, besides this 3D concept that we, we are uh, developing right now, I also have the experience to work with uh, industries they want to add uh, chatbots and you know getting all of those information that can be reasoned again. And with that, uh, what you get is a very first and good approach on what's in your data and how can you make it faster, how can you make it work with a broader vision that you didn't have before, like uh, searching for something in your database in ways that they are not the usual. And you have not only the semantic searches, but also the full text searches in the same query. So those are the things that are being transformed that apply to every industry. So uh if we are applying it we are and it's uh, making things faster and simpler but also we need to be more careful on what we deliver agreed um all right we have time i think for one more question and this is for every single panelist um what is the most difficult technology to learn I would argue it's the first one you learn. I feel like getting over that first technology hump, uh, just learning about whatever language you pick, learning programming, that's the hardest one to get your brain wrapped around. And I'm not going to say that everything's easy after that, but it's certainly easier to reason about how things work if you really understand how one thing works. And it's that first one that's that's difficult. Um, I, I would. I remember um, the first uh, the first language that I learned. I learned a lot by setting a breakpoint and and whatever language I was in, and then walking through the library that I was using and seeing how it did things and why it did things and understanding that. Um, I feel like that helped me understand. It can seem like a lot of of. Uh, a lot of concepts are just kind of given to you like magical tools that you pick up and use, but they're all written in code and and walking behind them can just help build that understanding of how things work. And once you learn that, you can extrapolate to other technologies as you uh, encounter them. Um, but it's that first one that you really have to like wrap your head around how it works. Um, and that, I don't know, that that's the hardest from my perspective. Long statements are your friend as well when debugging. Oh, yeah, log statements. I still do debug code. <laughs> like you, uh, Karen, uh, Carmen, uh, oh, Carmen as, as you said, I still uh, put breakpoints, even if the code is mine or not. Yes. So it's a lifelong practice. Yeah. For those of you who aren't using breakpoints, please use breakpoints. It can help you yeah. really reason about this thing that happens incredibly fast, and you get to slow it down and watch it. Unless to Kevin's point is threaded, and then and then it's weird because you are but dealing. Even with the this. internal state of your program uh, gives you a great insight of what's the alternative solution when you didn't think about it. Yep. And the uh, hardest technology that I still have to face is understanding other people's ideas, like reading papers. 
I still have a hard time. Or, reading or just humans. I would say humans are the yeah. hardest thing sometimes in general. Yeah. At the end of the day, you will master any technology that you face. Mm -hmm. But uh, keeping up with the ideas, I think it's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. I still can understand React, and I used to work with React like 10 years ago. <laughs> All right, Bruno, Jonathan, anything you want to add? Uh, hardest, uh, hardest technology, you think? Uh, I think the base of uh, JavaScript, HTML, and CCS, I think for me was easy. But to start making uh, architect for a database mm -hmm. was the hardest thing to do for me. Mm -hmm. Is you start from zero. No, you don't have nothing, and you have to start making a, the all the architect for a product for the database uh, to understand uh, all the business, what the client needs. Uh, how we start working uh, for me was difficult. Then with with some skills, etc., uh, the next experience was more easy. Awesome, thanks, Bruno. Any final thoughts from our speakers? Yeah, for for my side, the most difficult technology to learn is this cube. That is... That's not a Rubik's cube. That is a some <laughs> other shape cube. Yeah, it's an hexagonal, but it's the most difficult. That's to, impossible to, to face it. it. Just know, really... everyone. Yeah, no, that's absurd. That's I absurd. know it, that Rubik's cubes can seem intimidating, but just know you can have a career in software engineering without ever touching one. I am <laughs> proof of that. You do not need to be able to solve a Rubik's cube with your eyes closed to be able to be a good engineer. I don't know what it says about people who can, but you don't need it. I don't no, look for it no. on a resume. I do not. You stumbled across like a pet interest of mine, but it's actually trivial. Like once you learn how to actually yeah. solve a Rubik's cube, it's actually a trivial problem. Like it, it's legitimately easier than building like a simple web application. Okay, oh. now I, I'm officially scared right now. <laughs> huh? <laughs> That's like the yeah, reverse no, no. of a brag. You're like, no, it's no. actually really easy. No, I, I, bro, nobody believes believes me when I say this. I promise you. You can like take three hours, just watch like a YouTube tutorial, learn how to yeah. do it, and you'll you'll be like, oh my god, this is legitimately easier than building yeah. an application. Like, I seriously. feel like it's easy to hit a triple in softball. So it, <laughs> it just takes time I, and practice. I know and... for a fact. I know for a fact. I'm a terrible softball player, and I hate to admit that. But... All right. Well, I guess we'll leave it at that then. Uh, Amy threw a survey in the chat, so if you could fill that out, it helps us know whether we succeeded or failed miserably today to help you in your career endeavors. Um, and I'll hand it back over to you. Absolutely. So just just one closing remark really just i want to say thank you to the speakers you pro provided incredible value for our students like in fact in our slack channel uh the, the, w like one student i didn't catch their name but one student remarked on how like valuable they thought this was so i just i wanted to let you guys know that um, we'll take it and this will, thank you yeah, one student. <laughs> yeah i i feel bad i wish i could have got their name but um this will be uploaded i just pinned the the youtube channel where it'll be uploaded and if you want to watch this back either speakers or our student body i'm sure will be interested to see it so i know it's seven so i'll, I'll let you all go uh, and this was fantastic thank you for joining awesome thanks all speakers thanks all students who joined bye everybody thank you everyone thank you